Hi, my name is Chuck Smith. As the founder of the Ghost of Stephen J. Field Theater, I want to thank the Yuba Sutter Arts and Culture for hosting tonight's show, and I especially want to thank you for joining us. For those of you unaware of Stephen J. Field, you'll get a pretty decent introduction tonight as he conducts a search for the missing elements of Marysville's history. Ghosts get to keep their names, but not their titles. So we were unable to call this theater the Ghost of Supreme Court Justice Stephen J. Field Theater or the Ghost of Marysville All Call Day Stephen J. Field Theater. The Ghost of Stephen J. Field has been haunting Marysville for a while now in his quest to bring recognition to Marysville's history, and not just to himself, but to the, the many characters that came through here in the mid-19th century when California was transformed seemingly overnight. I'm not only the founder of the theater, but I'm the ticket taker and the janitor and the sound man. I'm the costume designer, and, and I'm also the host that comes out before the beginning of the show to remind you about your electronic devices and proper theater etiquette. If you've ever been to a live performance, you, you know what I mean. But we're not going to tell you to turn down your electronic devices. If you were to turn it off or turn it down, the theater would go dark. So instead, please turn it up. We want to make sure you hear every word of the multifarious mystery of Marysville's missing monuments. There is a mystery in Marysville. It's a mystery with many parts. And a lot of those parts seem to be missing. At least I can't find them. I've logged hundreds of thousands of steps scouring downtown in Ellis Lake. I've searched high and low all the public lands within the ring of protective levees that have kept Marysville from flooding since 1875, and still there is no sign of them. Yet they must exist. How could they not? They can't have just up and walked away. Here's what I'm getting at. Five essential monuments represent a story of Marysville. It's an important story about the tumultuous events of the mid-19th century. Dramatic events that shaped the future of our city, of California as a whole, and of the ability of the United States to survive civil war. Five essential monuments tell this story, and I can't find them anywhere. These monuments would be ornate and substantial. Not made of gold, although they've certainly pulled a lot of that out of the Yuba River watershed. Bronzed. They may have bronzed them. Or maybe they used some of those rare Yuba blue rocks from up around Smartsville. The monuments would be excellently crafted by fine artists and prominently displayed in public spaces. They would be revered and well-maintained, and certainly they'd be too heavy to move without someone noticing. Perhaps you can help me sort this out. I'll further describe what I'm looking for by telling the story these five monuments uh, represent. Now, it's a story that always must begin long, long before I arrived and almost single-handedly formed this city, <laughs> about 10,000 years before. That's how long the Maidu, the original occupants of this region, lived in harmony with nature along the rivers that course through the mountains, foothills, and valleys of this region. Before European and American extension decimated their numbers and changed their way of life forever. The native population of the lower and middle Sacramento Valley established a culture that included music and religion and art. It is estimated that because of the relatively abundant food supply and the mild temperatures, at the time the first European explorers set foot on the North American continent, this was the most densely populated region of the entire continent. Yes, Rand McNally would later declare this the worst place in the nation to live, but the Maidu knew better. As a matter of fact, this was at one time the population center of North America. Population estimates vary, but it is safe to say 
the prior to European discovery of the Americas, and into the early 19th century, at least 9,000 to 10,000 Maidu occupied the lower to middle Sacramento Valley region and the watersheds that drain into them, including the Sacramento, Bear, Yuba, and Feather Rivers. If explorer Jedediah Smith's diary is to be believed, they might have called the Feather River the Yalu River, and the Yuba River was named the Hennit. The Maidu lived in a series of villages dispersed along the waterways. It was so densely populated, and the region was so prone to flooding, that both the Spanish and the Mexican governments preferred to avoid it. The Jesuits, who established the missions along the coast, argued that the Spanish should give up on North Northern California altogether. I think if this is the first call to divide California into at least two states. So, one of the missing pieces of this mystery is the beautiful monument we must have built in Marysville to honor the 100 centuries of existence of the Maidu. Now, I've never seen it, but it's certainly uh, those who live in our city, now a mere 1.7 centuries old, recognize the significance of a culture that has 98 centuries on us in terms of longevity and success. Perhaps the monument that was created features a man poised to spear a salmon, the primary protein source that sustained the population, along with deer and elk and bear, and squirrels and rabbits. Likely there's a woman nearby fashioning an elaborately designed airtight basket for use in cooking, eating or storing food, hauling water, trapping animals, a baby's bed, or even a hat. The basket weaving skills of the Maidu women over the centuries uh, are to this day considered the best among all Native American basket weavers. And Maidu women continue to make them for their own use or, or for sale as art at some pretty hefty prices. Now, this monument might have had a child nearby, perhaps its eye on the father hunter or the mother basket weaver. For where summer seen, all would be scantily clad. Men and women wore little clothing in the hot summer months, but fashioned warm clothing out of the skins of game, the feathers of birds and stems and vines of native plants. Prominent would be the tribal tattoos on the face, arms, and chest and abdomens of the men and women. We Americans mocked what we called the Digger Indians, a slur attributed to the frequent sight of mighty women harvesting the roots and tubers of native plants. Americans considered their way of life subhuman, unsophisticated, lacking in imagination, uncivilized. But we were wrong. The Maidu had developed a beautiful culture that proved easy to maintain. Essentially, they had a 20-hour work week. That was all that was needed to provide for their families. The rest of the time was spent engaging in spiritual activities, creating works of art and music, gambling, enjoying the company of each other. But it was supplanted by an American culture that today requires 40 to 60 hours of work per week to meet basic needs. Maybe the Maidu had the better idea. By 1845, the belief that God intended the United States to expand across the entire continent was the official U.S. policy. Manifest destiny, as it became labeled, ended the dominance of the Maidu culture in Northern California. When the world rushed in after the discovery of gold, the Maidu were pushed aside time and time again, hunted for profit, enslaved, swindled by agents of the American government. Their children were kidnapped, abused, and traded to settle debts. The salmon fishery was destroyed by water pollution and over-harvesting to meet the protein needs of tens of thousands of miners. The acorn supply was diminished by the harvesting of the oak trees to 
provide lumber for houses, barns, businesses, hotels, things never before existing in the Sacramento Valley. Disease, murder, enslavement, starvation reduced the Maidu population by 90% by the beginning of the 20th century. The 1910 census identified 1,100 Maidu. The Maidu culture did not altogether disappear. The number of people identifying as Maidu increased with every census. Great effort is made by the Maidu to teach their children about their 100 century history, to honor their ancestors who developed California's first tools, watertight containers, fishing and hunting gear, art, houses, creation myths, and musical instruments, and dance moves. Certainly our citizens of Marysville recognize that at just 170 years, we stand in the large shadow of a culture that survived for 10,000 and have already constructed a substantial monument. That is one of the monuments that seems to have disappeared. Another part of the mystery is the location of the substantial monument that must have been erected to honor the sisters Murphy, Mary, Harriet, and Sarah, three women of the ill-fated Donner Party who settled, at least for a time, in the place that would be named for the youngest of them. Trapped in the snow in the Sierra Nevada mountains just 50 miles from the Sacramento Valley in the winter of 1846 and 47, half of the 90-member Donner Party perished. Most who made it out alive resorted to cannibalism to survive. Sarah and Harriet walked for 33 days in snowshoes and across rough terrain to give their children, left behind with their sister Mary and their rapidly deteriorating mother, a chance to be rescued. This is the story that shocked the nation and remains one of the most repeated cautionary tales of the American West. But most importantly, this is the story of the indomitable spirit of women, of mothers willing to go to every length to save their children. It is a mystery to me that I cannot find the monument that was most certainly erected by the people of Marysville to honor the strength, courage, and love of mothers. Sarah, Harriet, and Mary were the daughters of Levina W. Jackson Murphy. Born into a Baptist family and married at age 16, Levina and her husband became members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints a few years before he died. Understanding California to be the final destination of the saints, she responded to the urgings of both her church and the national government to join the westward expansion to fulfill God's wish that Americans should dominate the continent. At age 36, she left Kentucky and joined the Donner Party with 12 other members of her family, her seven children, three grandchildren, and two sons-in-law. Now, I'll dispense with the obligatory discussion about the relative lack of wisdom on the part of the men in this story. To leave for California so late in the spring, to take an unknown shortcut, to feud amongst themselves, etc., etc., etc. Searching for blame for how the Donner Party became trapped in the snow is not the point of the story. Keep your focus on the women. Sarah, the oldest of the daughters, turned 20 just one week after the progress of the wagon train was halted near the summit of the Sierra Nevada mountains, in the midst of a snowstorm on the final day of October in 1846. With her were her husband, William Foster, aged 30, and their two-year-old son, Jeremiah. Sarah's 18-year-old sister, Harriet, was mourning the loss of her husband, William Pike, in a gun accident just hours earlier near present-day Reno. But as the first of the ten major snowstorms of 1846 forced them to build a makeshift cabin against a large boulder at what is now called Donner Lake, 
The remainder of the Murphy Travelers were in good health. They were John Murphy, age 16, Mary Murphy, who was 15, Lemuel Murphy, 12, William Murphy, 10, Simon Murphy, 8, and Harriet's two daughters, Naomi Pike and the infant, Catherine Pike. Over the course of five miserable months, the Murphy family struggled to keep each other alive, making in the end the most difficult of decisions in the face of the most difficult of circumstances. Many focus on the survival cannibalism as a character flaw, but half those trapped in the snow were children under the age of 18, with parents willing to do whatever they could to keep them alive. What wouldn't a parent do? And what inhibitions fall and instincts prevail in the state of delirium brought on by starvation? The Donner Party story is about the drive to survive and sacrifices made for family. By mid-December, undernourished Harriet lost her ability to nurse baby Catherine. At this time, a group was forming to attempt to snowshoe over the summit and reach Johnson's Rancho at present-day Wheatland. Knowing her children and grandchildren would die if the people in the Sacramento Valley did not come to their rescue, Levina Murphy encouraged her oldest daughters to leave their children at the camp and embark on the perilous journey to bring rescuers back with them to save the children. Certainly, it is at this juncture in history that the artists turned to for inspiration to create the monument to the Murphy sisters. See in the statue that must have been erected the torment on the faces of the two young mothers leaning forward toward California in their thick wraps and snowshoes while looking backward toward Mary. Mary's holding Catherine, who is tightly wrapped against the cold. Naomi and Jeremiah are clutching nervously at her skirt. Mary's mouth is parted in awe of her sister's courage and, and the impossible nature of their mission. What mixture of sadness and determination and fatigue and resolve are seen in this heart-wrenching moment of parting? Maybe Sarah, the oldest, is facing forward, her hand on reluctant Harriet's arm to steal her nerves and encourage her forward. The snowshoe party numbered 15, five of whom were women. Among the men were two Maidu who delivered food and supplies to the wagon train, and Lemuel, Sarah and Harriet's eager 12-year-old brother, who joined the party even without snowshoes. William Murphy, just 10, also left with the original group, but could not keep up and turned back to camp. The party packed enough food to last four days. Their journey through deep snow and rough, unfamiliar terrain, however, would take those who survived 33 days. The food ran out quickly, and beginning shortly after Christmas, the group began making the choices that made the party famous across the country. Sarah's brother Lemuel was among those who did not make it. As the food ran out and they were down to their final biscuit, Lemuel insisted that Sarah have it. She refused. After several days of delirium, Sarah recalls holding her brother in the moonlight as he died. At another point along the way, Sarah's husband startled the rest of the party by shooting the two Maidu men for food, explaining they were uh, near death anyway. Sadly, this disregard for native Californians seemed to be the rule and not the exception among the encroaching Americans. All the more interesting then that it was the men and women of a Maidu village who found and aided the seven surviving members of what history now calls the Forlorn Hope. Only two men made it out alive. 
All five of the women lived through the arduous journey to see the Sacramento Valley and initiate rescue parties to the Sierra Nevada. Back at the lake, as they awaited rescue or certain death by starvation, the trapped pioneers prayed for their meager food supplies of boiled leather and rug fibers uh, to last until rescue came. By February, they would be digging frozen bodies out of the snow. Mary and her mother fed Catherine with the gruel of snow water and a sprinkling of coarse flour. John Murphy, the 16-year-old who took on all the chores previously shared with Sarah's husband and John's younger brother Lemuel, collapsed from exhaustion and died of starvation before the first of four relief parties arrived in mid-February. Harriet Murphy had left her kids at the lake for the chance to save them. And sadly, Catherine died just one day after the first relief party arrived. Mary, her brother William, and Harriet's toddler, Naomi, were carried to safety with the first rescue party. Jeremiah, Sarah's two-year-old boy, also died. Simon was rescued by the third relief party in March. As her eight-year-old son, who had been her last family comfort, was led out of a cabin, Levina, too weak to travel, turned her face to the wall. The rescuers left her some jerked meat, but she was found dead when the fourth relief party rescued the last of the Donner Party survivors in mid-April. Mary, Harriet, and Sarah were reunited at what later would be named Marysville after Mary, who, like Harriet, married one of the town's pioneer property owners. So you can clearly see by this happily ever after story that the residents of Marysville have erected a large monument to these courageous women who played a pivotal roles in the American story of westward expansion and whose determination should be an example for women and men of California. Where that monument is, I don't know. It's as much of a mystery as the missing monument to James Pearson Beckworth, the African-American mountain man and war chief of the Crow Nation, who discovered the lowest elevation pass of the Sierra Nevada and led the first intact wagon train into Marysville just five years after the Donner Party tragedy. Born into slavery, Beckworth was raised at the confluence of the Mississippi and Missouri rivers by his wealthy white father and his mother, a slave from Virginia. Apprenticed to a black ship at age 16, Beckworth met many of the fur trappers who were working the nearby river watersheds. In 1822, he answered a call for men to join an expedition up the Missouri River beginning a long career as a Western adventurer alongside the likes of Jim Bridger and Jedediah Smith. For nearly a decade, he lived among the Crow people of the American Plains, becoming a war chief. In 1856, Beckworth dictated his life story, and the result was The Life and Adventures of James P. Beckworth, Mountaineer, Scout, and Pioneer, and Chief of the Crow Nation of Indians chronicling adventures from southern Canada to Florida, from St. Louis to the Pacific Ocean. It is the first and only first-person account of life among the Plains Indians and was published in English, Spanish, and French to satisfy the European diet for tales from the romantic American West. The book made Beckworth a rock star. Published five years before the start of the American Civil War, it also made him a target of historians from universities in slaveholding states who attempted to diminish the importance of the mulatto mountain man they called the gaudy liar. Their strategy worked. Beckworth's role in exploring and settling the American West was essentially ignored. While legends were told and songs were written and movies were made about the very men he rode with, Beckworth's legacy was shoved to the back of the closet. When Beckworth was written into the script of a movie called Tomahawk in 1950, 
the tall, dark, athletic Beckworth, was portrayed by a short, dumpy white guy named Jack Oakey. Well, 100 years before that movie, the real Jim Beckworth followed a deer trail through the Sierra Nevada mountains and discovered a mountain passage large enough for wagons. It was some 1,800 feet lower in elevation than the pass over Donner Summit. He negotiated an agreement with the town officials and merchants of Marysville to create a wagon trail leading trains of pioneer families directly to the city for a payment of $10,000. Over the course of a year, he built a trail leading from the Truckee River at present-day Reno, over Beckworth's New Pass, into a mountain valley, down the Feather River Canyon, through present-day Plumas County and Butte County, all the way to Marysville. In late July and early August of 1851, he led the first wagon train over his New Pass into California. Among the train of 17 prairie schooners was a family from Illinois with a 10-year-old daughter who would go on to become California's first poet laureate. Anna Coolbrook described her family's ascent into California. We were guided by the famous scout, James Beckworth, who was a historical figure and, in my mind, one of the most beautiful creatures who ever lived. He was rather dark and wore his hair in two long braids twisted with colored cord that gave him a picturesque appearance. He wore a leather coat and moccasins and, and, and rode a horse without a saddle. Beckworth offered Coolbrith a lift on the front of his horse through the pass. And the image of the tall mountain man with a weathered aspect escorting the happy 10-year-old with eyes filled with wonder across the Sierra Nevada Divide into California, that's the one. It's got to be the scene, right? That's the, that's the moment that the artist throws in time in a monument that's now missing. It's, it's a very dramatic scene. Or perhaps the artist caught the moment where uh, Beckworth sets the girl down as the autumn storm clouds part and the valley below comes bathed in sunshine. And Beckworth says to the little girl, here is California, here is your kingdom. A few days later, that very wagon train rolled into Marysville. The first time an entire wagon train had made it all the way through the Sierra Nevada into the city. It is reported the entire town turned out for the arrival. If that's accurate, that would include the three Murphy sisters still living in the city. I wonder what they were thinking. It could not have escaped them how much tragedy could have been avoided if someone had just discovered that easier path five years sooner. Well, the rest of the crowd that day was certainly not melancholy about the arrival of the wagon train. A huge celebration erupted, and that night a fire consumed much of the downtown area. Over the course of the next several years, some 10,000 new pioneers arrived in Marysville by way of Beckworth Trail, including Phoebe Abbott Rideout, the first woman bank president in California. Beckworth, however, was never paid for his effort. The town fathers reneged on the agreement, citing the cost of rebuilding the burned-out town as reason. What normally could have resulted in a civil lawsuit, however, pretty much ended there. As a black man in California in 1851, Jim Beckworth had no standing in a court of law. Marysville did try to repay the debt in 1995 when it named its largest park Beckworth Riverfront Park. After the mountain man and, uh, and for a while there was a living history festival in his name, someday uh, the city might even put a sign up in front of the park with Jim's name on it. There is a fading mural to Jim Beckworth downtown and a, and a trail marker marking the end of his trail, but, but I can't anywhere find that large monument with him and the kid that has to be somewhere.
Hi, I'm Mary Langsdorf, president of Marysville Rotary, and I'm standing on the corner of 3rd and D Streets in Marysville, and boy, do we have a monument for you. Hi, I'm Jan Rockwell, also with the Rotary Club of Marysville, and we're here today to announce a big project in historic Marysville. Right here! Marysville Rotary is celebrating their 100th year by a nice, huge project for Marysville, and so what better way to say Happy 100 years than a clock plaza on uh, 3rd and D Street in Marysville. This clock tower is going to be approximately 14 feet high with seated areas around it to enjoy the atmosphere of historic Marysville. The clock plaza has four entries and the clock itself has four faces and that all ties into the four-way test. The clock is going to tie in Old Town History, D Street, Marysville. Um, we have the arches that are in the green color. Uh, the clock also will be that green color. Uh, the chimes, we will have various chimes throughout the year. Um, Christmas chimes at Christmas time uh, for every three hours. The clock plaza is going to have a walkway through into the Habitat for Humanity parking lot um, where we can do car shows and whatnot. Um, we are going to have a clock in the middle of that plaza. We have a couple of benches, um, nice beautiful plants. And also, uh, we have monuments surrounding the clock with our president's names. A second Rotary Club project is equally exciting. It involves a partnership with the Yuba County Library and the Appeal Democrat. Perhaps as early as next week, every available edition of every newspaper in Marysville for 171 years will be available for free. The online link is located on the Yuba County Library website. This is possible as a result of the Appeal Democrat waiving any copyright claims to any of the content in the library's digital real archive. In addition, our Rotary Club is happy to announce we are paying to have 90 drawers with approximately 125,000 3 by 5 inch index cards containing stories from newspapers, Marysville City Council minutes, and several rare books stored in the California room. This copied into searchable digital format and made available online also on the Yuba County website. Several decades of school enrollment records from the Marysville area schools will also be scanned and stored in digital format. I recently got together with the Appeal Democrat editor, Steve Miller, and the Yuba County Library's Administrative Services Officer, Sandeep Sidhu, and was able to view the front page of the very first edition of Marysville's newspaper, The Herald, from August 6, 1850. The Marysville Rotary Club is proud to present these two projects to the community and trust they will generate much thought and enjoyment for the generations to come. Hello, I'm David Reed, Executive Director of Yuba Center Arts and Culture and a newly appointed member of the Yuba County Historic Resources Commission. Thanks for tuning in this evening to watch the multifarious mystery of Marysville's missing monuments. Chuck does an outstanding job of channeling Justice Field, who was a very colorful character in and of himself, but also as a vehicle to discuss more of Marysville's history and the fascinating folks that have contributed to her story. We hope this program will help inspire an ongoing conversation about the need for more public art, monuments, and signs that can help tell those stories for the enjoyment of us residents, as well as visitors who may have no idea what went on here. Speaking of which, I'm standing in front of the newly created Arboga Assembly Center Memorial Site and Interpretive Center. We have a few more pieces to add, but this location is across the street from what was a temporary housing facility, originally a migrant farm workers camp that was repurposed in 1942 and used to temporarily house 2,500 Japanese Americans before they were sent off to more permanent concentration camps. You'll be hearing more about this project in the weeks ahead as we near completion, just before Day of Remembrance observations on February 19th, so stay tuned. There's lots more coming your way this year from Yuba Sutter Arts and Culture, virtual for the first half of the year, but we hope to be back into the full swing of things by July. Fingers crossed. We'll do our very best to ensure that the arts and culture and history are kept alive and well and thriving in Yuba Sutter. Follow Yuba Sutter Arts on Facebook and Instagram. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. Check out our website, yubasutterarts.org, and keep up with all the great things we have to offer. Now back to the multifarious mystery of Marysville's missing monuments. 
Come to think of it, I can't find the monument that was built to properly honor the Chinese pioneers who were an invaluable, uh, if much abused, workforce beginning with the gold rush. Yes, the Chinese community has erected a house of worship here that is a national treasure. And yes, Marysville is the site of California's oldest parade, the Bacchae Parade, named after the temple. But both of these are gifts from the Chinese community to Marysville. And they're held in you know, dear to the hearts of people in Marysville. The young men who fled the inflation and riots of southwest China came to California attracted by the same dream of striking it rich as the mostly young men from other parts of the world. Chinese began entering California soon after word of the gold strike reached the ports in southern China. Prejudice against the Chinese manifested quickly. In 1850, Chinese were required to pay $20 a week for a for foreign miners' tax not charged to free white people of other foreign nations. In 1852 alone, 20,000 Chinese came to California gold fields. Chinese called California Gold Mountain and identified San Francisco, Sacramento, and Marysville as First City, Second City, and San Fao, or Third City. Over the course of several decades, the Chinese men found work in any industry that would have them. Men became domestic servants, washed clothes, or cooked. This was valuable labor to a gold rush population that was 90% male. Not only were they critical to building the railroad through the Sierra Nevada, they were hired as miners by the larger companies moving into the Yuba River watershed and to reclaim the swamps of the Sacramento Valley. They worked in the grape fields for early wine production in Yuba County. Marysville developed a large Chinese population between 1850 and 1900. According to the census of 1880, one quarter of all Marysville residents were Chinese. The benefits to the entire region of the business activity generated by this population cannot be overstated. Marysville's Chinatown, which is one of the oldest in the United States still in existence, was ideally located, offering merchandising services to mining camps to the north and the east. It was regularly supplied with goods and materials by river boats via the Sacramento and Feather Rivers, and also by stagecoaches. According to a business directory of Wells Fargo Bank in 1878, Marysville's Chinatown boasted some two dozen Chinese firms. By 1882, according to Wells Fargo, Chinese businesses had nearly doubled in number. Marysville's Chinatown was a place for rest and entertainment to thousands of Chinese miners and laborers. It was a bustling and lively community on weekends and during holidays, drawing between 500 and 2,000 Chinese at times. In addition to serving as a shopping center for those Chinese coming from the mines and other outlying labor camps, it provided buried entertainment and a place for worship, the Bakai Temple. Marysville's Chinatown also included the Sui Sing and Hop Sing Lodges, a Masonic Lodge, a Chinese School, and not just one, but two opera houses. Both opera houses regularly scheduled top entertainers from San Francisco and China. The Federal Act excluding Chinese from immigrating to the United States adopted in 1882 began six decades of exclusion of Chinese. Nevertheless, Marysville's Chinatown continued to thrive into the first half of the 20th century. Chinese farmers were supplying Chinese restaurants throughout the West with produce grown in fields that now comprise East Marysville and the Richland Housing Center in Yuba City. I suspect the artist who built the monument I can't find created one of a miner or a gardener with long braided hair diligently performing the work. But perhaps the artist was inspired by the prayer leaders at the Bacchae Temple where statues to the water god Bacchae and eight other deities reside. The prayer master comes to the temple to ask the deities important questions 
and then shakes a round container with no lid containing 50 prayer sticks with numbers coinciding to uh, answers often hidden in fables and requiring the interpretation of the prayer leader. Well, given Marysville's history of flooding, it's no accident the Chinese pray to the water god Bacai. Marysville's not flooded since 1875, and I would not be the first to suggest Bacai has something to do with the, with the city being spared, despite several close calls, including 1955, when the prayer leader, Zhou Lung Kim, banged the gong and beat the drum to wake the gods, asked Bok Ai whether Marysville would be safe, shook the box of prayer sticks, and got the number two. Bok Ai says everything's going to be okay in Marysville, and it was, recalls Ong Hong Lung, who was there that day. The Bakai Temple is located at the levee at D Street. In 1955, the bridge across the Yuba River entered Marysville at D Street. The night before Christmas Eve, it took a heroic effort by military men and civilian men along the First Street levee to save the city from flooding. Bakai and the number two proved to be correct. Yes, I'm certain Marysville did not forget to honor the Chinese and that the monument is simply hard to find for some reason. Now, lastly, I've been looking for the monument that was erected in my honor. Now, I'm sure it's the best of the lot. After all, not every town can boast that one of its founders was chosen by America's most famous presidents to sit on the United States Supreme Court, wrote almost all of California's early laws, kept Marysville safe in its infancy, and was twice seriously considered for president, despite being disbarred from the practice of law and arrested on a murder charge. And you thought Jim Beckwith led an interesting life. I arrived at what became Marysville from New York at age 32 on January 15, 1850. I came to California because working in my brother's law firm in New York was stifling. I wanted to be part of what was going on in California. I wanted to help build a new civilization. And that's exactly what we did. After landing in San Francisco, I tried to open a law business, but I spent most of my time in the saloons, talking to the miners about activities in the interior of the state. I decided to take an opportunity to become a lawyer in what promised to be a thriving new town called Vernon. So I hopped a steamship from San Francisco to Sacramento, and from there, upstream to Vernon. Well, when we arrived at Vernon, it was underwater. So I stayed on the steamship until it came to the confluence of the Yuba and Feather Rivers. Here I found a throng of several hundred miners uh, living in tents and muddy streets, and an adobe house where they had a map spread out on a table, and they were signing people up to buy lots. I signed up to purchase several of the lots, despite having little to no money. Word got around that a big investor from San Francisco had landed there, and the owners of the property called on me. I convinced them to hold an election to form a city. And three days later, I was elected all call day. A mix of justice of the peace and mayor all rolled into one under the old Mexican school of law that still prevailed in California at that time. Now, the election was close. My opponent in the race argued that he was more qualified, pointing out that I had arrived there only three days earlier. His argument? He'd been there twice as long. The night of the election, we drank French champagne and agreed to name the city after Mary Murphy, Mr. Kovalod's wife. Now, it could just as easily have been Saraville or Harrietville, but Mr. Kovalod owned more land and his wife was younger. As I'll call day, I implemented the whipping post to ensure law and order and avoid lynchings. And Marysville was always a quiet, law-abiding community during my short tenure as Marysville's first politician. I ordered the grading of the river's edge at the Marysville to promote the landing of steamships. 
Over the course of eight years, I was uh, an assemblyman and in that capacity uh, wrote the first civil and penal codes of the state. I was a private attorney in Marysville. I was a candidate for state senate. And ultimately, I was elected to the California Supreme Court, serving as its chief justice. In March of 1863, during the Civil War, pleased with my support of the Union and Northern California's continued support of the Union by shipping gold north, I was appointed by Abraham Lincoln to the United States Supreme Court. This was the first such appointment of anyone from west of the Mississippi River, and, and it occurred despite the fact that I was a Democrat and he was a Republican. Upon my retirement from the bench in 1897, I held the record for the longest tenure of any other member of the court of 34 years and six months. While on the Supreme Court, I was twice considered by the Democratic Party for President of the United States. But some political enemies in California intervened both times. I was twice the subject of assassination attempts. Once when somebody sent me a crude explosive device in a mailed package I mistook as a Christmas present from my in-laws and another time which resulted in the death of the assailant on a train at Lathrop, California. Although he was shot by a federal marshal assigned to protect me by the United States Attorney General, the sheriff of Stockton arrested me on a murder charge that was immediately dismissed. I'm sure the artist had many scenes to choose from in designing the monument he must have built for me, but I imagine it is of the younger me during my time in Marysville and not the older me when I was on the bench. Perhaps there's a book in my hand, perhaps a whip. Perhaps I'm standing on a barrel, giving a rousing speech to stop a crowd from hanging a woman. Oh wait, they kicked me off that barrel and they hung the woman anyway. Or perhaps my hands are thrust into my pockets of a waistcoat and the outline of pistols poking through the pocket fabric are evident. I was raised a good New England boy uh, who uh, was taught to turn the other cheek and, and didn't carry weapons, but uh, I quickly learned in California that men like that were taken advantage of by other men. After threats on my life in Marysville, I had special pockets made, sewn into a waistcoat, large enough to hold pistols and I practiced shooting the pistols without removing them from the pockets, and I got good enough to hit a target from a, from a good distance. I don't know what image the sculptor chose, but I know this town knows about monuments. I found a lot of them walking around the city. There's monuments to the levee guy, the late guy. Oh, hey, they turn out to be the same guy. <laughs> Monument to public employees, brothels. There are lots and lots of memorials, but I'm stumped about the locations of the substantial monuments that certainly must have been constructed to honor the Maidu, the Murphy sisters, Jim Beckworth, the Chinese, and yours truly. I mean, they really cannot have walked away on their own. So the mystery remains, just where are they?